In this video, you are going to see how a buffer titration experiment is performed in lab. Remember that buffers are substances that resist changes in pH when acids or bases are added. So what we're trying to determine here is the buffering capacity of a buffer and also the pH range at which it is most effective. The buffering capacity has to do with how much acid or base has to be added to the buffer before it starts to change in pH. The pH range refers to the pH of the buffer while it is resisting those changes in pH due to the addition of the acid or a base. So each buffer has an ideal range of pHs that it works at. For example, the buffering system in our blood maintains our blood at a pH of between 7.35 and 7.45, and that buffering system wouldn't work very well at a pH of 2 or a pH of 11. You can use an experiment like this one to determine the pH at which the buffer is most effective. In the experimental setup that you see here, the buffer is inside of the conical flask. The acid is inside of the tall, skinny glass tube called a burette, and you twist a little knob called a stopcock to release small amounts of acid into the buffer at a time, um, like, um, like one milliliter at a time, say, and then you use the pH meter on the right to measure the pH of the buffer um, and to see how it changes in response to the addition of acid. Then you repeat the experiment and do the same thing with a base in the burette. You add a milliliter at a time or some small volume at a time of base and measure how the pH changes in response to the addition of the base. One thing I want to point out here is that the conical flask with the buffer on it is sitting on top of a magnetic stirrer. So that device with the sort of lavender colored front and the knob on it has a magnet inside that spins and you control the speed of the spinning magnet with that knob on the front of the device. And then what you do is you put a second magnetic bar that's like a plastic coated magnetic bar. You drop it in the conical flask so that it spins and it stirs the solution for you the whole time that you're adding the acid or the base. In this particular experiment, we're starting with the acid. So the data that we are going to record is what volume of acid did we add to the buffer, and what was the pH of the buffer after we added that much acid. Then we are going to create a graph known as a titration curve that shows the relationship between the amount of acid or base that we added and the pH of the buffer solution. Here you can see that the burette is full to the top with acid, and we turn the stopcock until it releases one milliliter of acid, then we look at the pH, we wait for it to stop changing, and then we record that number in our data table and we plot it on our graph. In this experiment, the original pH of the buffer was 6.6, .6, so adding one milliliter of the acid decreased the pH by 0.1. Now we add another milliliter of acid, and let's see how much the pH decreases. So it didn't really decrease at all, so we must still be within our range at which our buffer is working. So now we're going to add a third milliliter of the acid. See how it changes the pH. Now our pH is starting to change a little bit more significantly, so we've gone to 6.4, we dropped another 0.1. By the way, this acid is probably like hydrochloric acid, dilute hydrochloric acid or something like that. Now we're adding our fourth milliliter of acid to the buffer. Let's see how it changes the pH. Well, that's weird. It didn't change it very much. Okay, maybe we are still within our buffering capacity. And again, you know, there's a little bit of error inherent in some of these systems, so it won't be perfect, but you'll start to get a trend line. So if you keep adding and you keep adding and you keep adding, eventually you'll reach the point where the buffer isn't really working very well anymore to buffer the solution, and you'll start to see a steeper change in pH. Here, for example, you can see that the 
buffer maintains a steady pH of about 6.4 until you get to six milliliters of acid being added and then the pH starts to drop. So six milliliters of acid, it drops to six, seven milliliters of acid, it drops to five and it just keeps dropping. Then you repeat the same experiment with a base. So here's the data for adding one milliliter at a time of a base like sodium hydroxide. You can see that the pH hasn't increased too much when you add one or two milliliters of sodium hydroxide, but then by the time you add three milliliters, it starts to increase more quickly. So now you see the complete titration curve. It's got that flat line in the middle that's kind of the trademark of a curve for a buffer. If you got a curve that just was kind of a straight line that slanted from the top left to the bottom right, you probably wouldn't be working with a very good buffer because there wouldn't be any pH range at which um, the pH was stable. And from this curve, you can determine the buffering capacity of this buffer, meaning how much acid or base needs to be added to the buffer before it stops being an effective buffer. And that involves math that we're not going to worry about here. I just want you to understand that, that main concept. Um, and then you can also determine the pH range over which a buffer is effective. So in this case, it looks like this buffer is effective from around pH 6.4 to pH 6.9.